Good morning. Um, by this time, I've been almost two weeks on vacation. Uh, I'm sure I'm having fun with our grandkids and our kids, and I hope you guys are uh, doing well, that you're uh, being safe and taking care of yourself. Um, this will be um, a lesson. We're going to cover three chapters this morning, uh, 12, 13, and 14. So it could be a little long, uh, hopefully not. Uh, before we get started, let's bow our heads. Our Father, thank you uh, so much for being able to continue this study. Uh, we hope and pray that uh, each and every one in class are uh, being blessed, are being safe, being taken care of. Uh, bless those who are not here today. Uh, be with each and every one of us as we continue this study. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, um, I'd like to kind of lead in each uh, lesson with a little bit of summary of what we've done so far. Uh, preceding lessons, the past Sundays, have brought us to the middle of the tribulation. Uh, the seven seals have been opened. The seven trumpets have sounded. Uh, the saints, those martyred during the tribulation, have asked God for mercy and an end to persecution. Uh, God is praised and worship in heaven. By the four beasts, the 24 elders, and the saints, including those alive on earth, um, whose prayers rise to the heaven's throne room and collect as uh, smoke underneath the altar. Uh, be aware that Revelation is really the only book in uh, pretty much in the entire Bible that speaks to what goes on in heaven. Uh, so absorb this, the celebrations, the concerns, um, the worship given the uh, Lord and, uh, and Jesus and those in attendance. These next two chapters, um, 12 and 13, shift to symbolically introduce us to a group of important figures. And uh, this is not a step-by-step -step narrative like the seven trumpets and the seven seals. This is, uh, that's not necessarily chronological. Uh, the events that we're about to describe cover a wide variety of time, past, present, and future. In the course of all these visions, seven main characters are described. Uh, the first five appear in chapter 12, the next two in chapter 13. Uh, chapter 13's characters are two powerful figures. We often refer to them as the Antichrist, which we've talked about before, and another person called the False Prophet. Chapter 14 also uh, is not a chronological account of the end times. The events described in this chapter uh, show Christ returning the second time. Remember, the first time was at the rapture, and now he, on a couple of our chapters, uh, repeated, as John often does, the same event, Christ returns, uh, to end the tribulation period. So let's get started with, uh, with chapter 12. Uh, this is interesting. John returns to an earlier stage and begins all over. Uh, did you know that the book of Revelation contains the story of the birth of Christ that we often read in Luke 2? Uh, chapter 12 can be characterized as a flashback, telling the story of Christ's birth and Herod's attempt to kill Jesus at his birth. Now, instead of an historical narrative that we read in Luke 2, you know, in the time of Caesar's Augustus when the first census was taken and so on and so forth, we read about a heavenly tableau of characters portrayed in Near Eastern imagery. Uh, there are countries uh, who tell stories in a manner very similar to this, including the Babylonians, the Persians, the Egyptians, and the Greek. They all have a mythology that uh, John kind of mimics here as he tells the story of Jesus' birth. Uh, John starts off in chapter 12 uh, with a new heavenly vision. We meet a woman uh, about to give birth. The woman represents the nation of Israel. The child is the Messiah. There is a third character, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, which we'll meet time and time again in the remaining chapters of Revelation. 
uh, who stands before the woman uh, waiting to devour her child once it's born. Now the dragon represents the enemy of God and Israel. He's big. A mere flick of his tail knocks out uh, one third of the stars in the sky. And he is a manifestation of Satan. So when you talk about the beast, the red beast, we're really talking about Satan, who is his manifestation. Uh, the unmentioned figure, Satan, of course, is using the dragon to oppose God's plan. Now, Satan's eagerness to have the dragon devour the child explains why there's violent opposition to Jesus that he saw during his earthly mission, including Herod's slaughter of Bethlehem's children all the way through to Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. However, God snatches the child away and takes him to his throne. This would be a reference to Christ's ascension. In telling the Luke story this way, John shares with us the deadly enmity of Satan, his defeat, and the raising of Christ to a place of supreme power. So let's open up this scene uh, and think of Luke chapter 2 and how John is retelling this story. Um, we'll read the first six verses, and again, I'm reading out of the voice. As I looked, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman came into view, clothed in the radiance of the sun, standing with the moon under her feet. And she was crowned with a wreath of twelve stars on her head. She was painfully pregnant and was crying out in agony of labor. Then a second sign appeared in heaven, ominous, foreboding. A great red dragon with seven crowned heads and ten horns. The dragon's tail brushed one-third of the stars from the sky and hurled them down to the earth. The dragon crouched in front of the laboring woman, waiting to devour her child the moment it was born. I do have an um, artist's rendition of this that you'll be looking at. She gave birth to a male child who is destined to rule the nations with an iron scepter. Uh, before the dragon could bite and devour her child, the child was whisked away and brought to God in his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where God had prepared a place of refuge and safety where she could find sustenance for 1260 days. There's again that reference to half of the tribulation. So a battle breaks out in heaven. The uh, dragon is angry that uh, he couldn't get the child. And so he gets into a fight in heaven with the angel Michael. Now, Michael is the archangel of Israel, um, I guess an angel who specially looks out for the nation. Uh, the dragon is defeated, and Michael casts him down out of heaven. And, of course, heaven is happy, and they rejoice. I'm in chapter 12, verse 7. A battle broke out in heaven. Michael, along with his heavenly messengers, clashed against the dragon. The dragon and his messengers returned to fight, but they did not prevail and were defeated. As a result, there was no place left for them in heaven. So the great dragon, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was cast down to the earth along with his messengers. Then I heard a great voice in heaven. The voice says, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and authority of his anointed one have come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who relentlessly accuses them day and night before our Lord has been cast down and silent. By the blood of the Lamb and the, and the word of their witnesses, they have become victorious over him. For they all did not hold on to their lives, even under the threat of death. Therefore rejoice, all of you heavens, celebrate, all of you who live in them. But disaster will befall the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to your spheres. And he is incredibly angry because he knows his time is nearly over. So it was good for heaven. They rejoiced. Not so good for the people on earth. And, and the devil is angry. He's, uh, he knows that his time on earth is short. Um, the victory by Michael is really symbolic, uh, representing the victory over sin through Christ's atonement uh, caused by or as a result of his sacrifice on the cross. But Satan persists in his hostility toward the church and God's people. 
the Jews as the dragon continues to bring ha harm to the woman's other children, uh, the people of Israel and the church. So the woman has other children and they are the Jews and the church. And so the dragon is after them now, uh, verse 13. When the dragon realized he had been cast down to earth, he pursued the mother of the male infant. In order to escape the serpent, she was given two wings of the great eagle to fly deeper into the wilderness to her own special place where she would find sustenance for a time and times and a half. Again, reference to, remember the woman represents Israel, and she's going to be saved for three and a half years. Remember the mark of the Lord on the Christians and the believers who kept them from uh, experiencing the judgments of God. Then from his mouth a serpent spewed water like a raging river that chased after the woman, trying to sweep her away in the flood. But the earth came to her rescue. It opened its gaping mouth and swallowed the river that spewed from the dragon's mouth. As a result, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went, went to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. And the dragon stood waiting on the sand of the seashore. So ends chapter 14. Another way to express Luke 2, the birth of Christ, and all the sin and, and uh, things that the devil did afterwards that uh, brought tragedy. Um, heaven rejoices that uh, Satan has been cast out, but uh, certainly not the folks on earth. Satan vents his anger at all people believers included, but especially the Jews. And note that the woman, Israel, is protected by God for three and a half years. So chapter 13 now introduces us, introduces us to the last two major figures. These two beasts, and not to be confused with the red beast, are actually evil, powerful men who corrupt Israel by forcing idolatry on everyone. And not explicitly named in the Bible, um, they do have one name. Uh, they are most often referred to as the Antichrist and as the false prophet. John does uh, use the label the false prophet on occasion. Um, <clears throat> later in Revelation, God sends an army to Israel to, uh, to punish their idolatry. This text um, also mentions two other famous concepts. In addition to these two, the Antichrist and the false prophet, we also hear of the mark of the beast and the number 666, which identifies those who have rejected God in favor of Satan. Things that uh, are frequently pulled out of context in the, in the book. So two of Satan's uh, agents appear, and along with the dragon, the red dragon, comprise a counterfeit trilogy. It's kind of interesting. We have the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they have the red dragon, um, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Um, a frightful beast arises out of the sea and is given power by the dragon, by Satan. His many heads symbolize the Roman Empire with all of its rulers. Now you could go and try to identify all of them and sometimes the words are confusing and it's kind of an enigma. I'm not going to really deal with that. John understood the beast um, to be in competition with Christ for allegiance and worship. Uh, the beast opens its mouth and he blasphemes God. Uh, not, um, not hard to recall the Roman emperors who call themselves God and demand to be worshipped um, as one. Uh, the world is divided into two. Those in God's book of life who refuse the beast and those who worship the beast and do his bidding. So I'm in chapter 13, first 10 verses. I saw a beast with 10 horns and seven heads rising out of the blackness of the sea. On his horns hung 10 crowns and on his heads were inscribed blasphemous names. This beast was like a leopard. Its feet were like claws of a bear and its mouth was like the jaws of a lion. Sounds like um, a little bit like the four beasts and Ezekiel's uh, um, description. The dragon bestowed it with its power and throne and gave it authority. One of the beast's heads appeared to have suffered a fatal blow, but its mortal wound had somehow been healed. Uh, that 
kind of refers to a miracle that the false prophet um, conducts when he brings uh, one of the rulers back to life, but I won't get into that too much. Amazed at the miracle and its power, all the earth followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast because of his power. And we have a question. Who can match the beast? Who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth that bellowed arrogant boasts and uttered great blasphemies, and it was permitted to do what it will for 42 months. Its mouth opened with a stream of insults against God, blaspheming his name, cursing his dwelling, and those who live in heaven. Also it received permission to declare war against the saints and conquered them. Um, not a single nation, people, language, or ethnicity could escape its dominion. The inhabitants of the earth will worship it, that is, all those whose names have not been recorded before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slaughtered. So we have uh, the beast out of the sea, uh, the Antichrist, who demands uh, and exhibits power and causes people to do what they don't want. But they're still believers, still people who are left after the rapture that turn to the Lord and must suffer the consequences from the beast, from the Antichrist. Now John introduces us to another character, a second beast, but this time who rises out of the land. It has horns like a lamb, but its true nature is um, revealed when it speaks. It has a voice like a dragon. This beast is called the false prophet, and it promotes the worship of the emperor by means of spectac spectacular tricks or bogus religion. So it's, it's a magician who tries to make the beast out of the sea more powerful or seem to be uh, someone that people would follow or worship. If the Antichrist is a counterfeit Christ, then the false prophet is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. The false prophet will point to the Antichrist and compel people to worship him and Satan through the beast. He will be a deceiver and he'll use special tricks even reproducing some of the miracles that were performed by God's two witnesses, you remember from last Sunday, including bringing the first beast back to life. That's the reference to one of the heads being having had a mortal wound, but back again. So I'm in chapter 13, verse 11 through 15. As I watched, I saw a second beast, this one rising up from the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it was speaking with the voice of a dragon. This earth beast exercised all the authority given to it by the first beast, the red beast. And it forces the earth and all its inhabitants to bow down and worship the first beast out of the sea, whose mortal wound had been healed. And the earth beast performs fantastic miracles, like Elijah on Mount Carmel. It even causes fire to blaze down from heaven to earth for all to see. Since it is allowed to perform these miracles in the presence of the first beast, the earth beast deceives the inhabitants of the earth, commanding them to make an image of the first beast that had survived the mortal wound inflicted by the sword. And the earth beast was granted permission to breathe into the image and to animate it so that it could even speak. So by trickery and false religious um, actions, uh, the false prophet elevates the um, Antichrist to a position of authority and religiosity that is false uh, because he represents uh, the, the devil, the Satan. So not content to control the people through religious deceit, the false prophet will invite an institute strong economic measures as well in an order in order to buy and sell everyone on earth will have to receive a special mark uh, the only way to get the mark will be to submit to the beast and worship him so this is a strong allusion to a caesar's worship in the roman empire we talked about the guilds you remember in uh, one of the cities where in order to in order to really flourish in your trade you had to um engage in or try not to engage in um, 
pagan practices. Well, um, maybe John's thinking here was uh, the coinage of the emperors. Remember, uh, the ancient coins had pictures of the emperor and uh, his image and title on it, and that's what you had to use to trade with. And so um, now the false prophet has got religious things going on, and now he requires uh, worship of the emperor before you can get this mark of 666 in order to engage in economics. So he's kind of got people over the barrel. So um, I'm in uh, 13 again, um, verse 15b. It decreed that those, he's talking about the uh, false prophet, those who refuse to worship the image of the first beast must be killed, and the earth beast mandates that all humans must carry a mark on their right hands or foreheads, both great and small, both rich and poor, both free and slave. <coughs> Excuse me. Those who do not carry this mark, that is, those who do not have the name of the first beast or the number representing his name inscribed on them are not allowed to sell their wares or buy in the market. Here is the divine wisdom. So John is injecting this, giving us some information about what the mark is and what it stands for. That anyone who understands these mysteries figure out the number of the beast because it is the number of a person. Its number is 666. Let me read that again. It is the number of a person and the number is 666. This special mark, called the mark of the beast, is 666. Now, in the ancient world, um, letters of the alphabet were often used for numbers. So, my name, Al, A is the first letter of the alphabet, L is the uh, twelfth letter of the alphabet, so if you wanted to write my name, you could call me 112. One for A, 12 for um, L, Lauber. So many scholars have tried to uh, unravel this mystery of who 666 is. Uh, the name most frequently come up with as uh, solving this puzzle is Nero Caesar. In truth, there are lots of names uh, that you can use for it. It depends on whether or not what language you use and how you um, put the letters together. Um, the number 666 is in my mind, less than perfection. Remember, seven is perfection. Six is less than perfection, and it's three times. So it's very imperfect, uh, and maybe that's what we need to know. But it, yet, uh, this Mark of the Beast 666 has engaged scholars for centuries about who John was really talking about. So we're in chapter 14. And uh, in chapter 14, we jump to the end of the tribulation when Christ returns a second time, the first time at the rapture, and now a second time to end the tribulation, to defeat all remaining wickedness on the earth. The chapter opens with a scene of tranquility and rejoicing. John used and sees the Lamb on Mount Zion with 144,000, that number we've um, seen before, of the redeemed. Uh, rejections of God and idolatry are often referred to in uh, Hebrew text and certainly in Revelation uh, as sexual immorality. In the Old Testament, contact with pagan worship was called fornication or adultery. And in these opening verses where John identifies 144,000 as virgins who have not had sexual relations, what he really means is they have not and have abstained from idol worship. And so let's look at 14 in the first five verses. The scene changed. I looked up and saw the lamb standing on the top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And with him were the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name inscribed on their foreheads. Remember the mark of the Lord to protect them from the judgments that he brought down to the earth. And I heard a voice from heaven, roaring like waterfall, and clapping like thunder. The voice I heard was like a sympathy of harpists playing their instruments. As I watched, they began to sing a new song before the throne, the four living creatures and the 24 elders. 
The only ones with the ability to learn this song were the 144,000 who had been rescued from the earth, virgins who had not given themselves to sexual relations. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They have been purchased from among humanity as the first fruits, set apart for God and the lamb. In their mouths, no lie was found, no blemish marred them. In the next scene, we have uh, angels. Uh, I guess you could think about them flying by with a message. At least six different angels are involved in the next scene. Uh, each one has a particular message to proclaim. The first angel calls people back to basics. God is the creator. Worship and serve him. The creator. Uh, the beast will convince humans that God is in charge of the world and that their destinies are in his hands. But John knows that all creation bears witness to God as well as his power and wisdom. The second angel anticipates events we will study in chapters 17 and 18 and announces that Babylon has fallen. We're going to hear about the word Babylon a lot and it really means, to John, the city of Rome. Babylon is God's name for the beast's world of economic and political and religious systems. Uh, the third angel directs its message to those who are deciding whether or not to follow the beast. The easy way is to follow the beast. Is it? I mean, uh, which is better, the reign with Christ forever or with the beast for a short period of time because he is about to go under. So let's look at 6 through 12 and 14. I saw another messenger flying through the mid heavens. He carried an eternal gospel bringing good news to all the citizens of the world, every ethnicity, nation, language, and people. I'm making sure I'm in the right area here. He says with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, for the time of judgment has arrived. Worship the one who fashioned heaven and earth and created the seas and the springs. So he's talking about God the creator. He is the one to be worshipped. Another messenger, a second, came along. He says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great city. She has intoxicated all the nations with the wine of, of the wrath of her sexual perversion. Again, idolatry. And then the third messenger, a third follows and says in a loud voice, those who worship the beast and its image and all who receive its mark on their foreheads or on their hands will be forced to drink the wine of God's wrath, poured out, undiluted into the cup of God's anger, and they will face the torment of fire and the anger of sulfurous flames before the holy messengers and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise throughout the ages for eternity. Day and night will come and go without pause or cessation. There will be no end to the torture experienced by those who worship the beast and its image and by those who receive the mark of its name. And here is the patient endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and remain faithful to Jesus. So it's pretty clear, you don't wanna be on the wrong side of this judgment. Uh, a forever thing of agony and torment is not where you want to be. Um, do you know that, uh, among other things, Revelation has a set of Beatitudes, very similar to what Christ taught in the Sermon on the Mount back in Matthew chapter 5. Um, you may want to underline these as we go through them in your Bible. The first one was in uh, chapter 1, verse 3 of Revelation. And let me quickly go to it and read it to you. I know we talked about it at the time. Chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed blessings come to those who read and proclaim these words aloud. Blessings come to those who listen closely and put the prophetic words recorded here into practice. So we said earlier that we are going to be blessed through our study. The second one here occurs, which I haven't read yet, occurs in um, chapter 14, verse 13. It says, uh, record this, blessed are the dead who have died in the Lord from now until the end. Um, and there are others, and as we get to them, uh, I'll point them out. I've also got a list of them so you can have them at, at, uh, at 
as your reference and I'll, I'll get those out to you. Um, the next vision is of Christ, the Son of Man, seated on a cloud with a gold wreath on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Uh, the mental image here is of a harvest, a grain harvest and a, a grape harvest. Now, winning lost souls to Christ is often pictured as a harvest. The grape harvest, on the other hand, is often a picture of God's judgment. So there are two harvests here. It's pretty obvious which ones are good and which ones are bad. So this next image uh, anticipates the final judgment of the world. Uh, maybe here anticipating the battle of Armageddon, which happens in chapter 16, which we haven't gotten to yet. Um, so let me read um, Revelation and finish off the chapter 13 through 20. Then I heard a voice call out from heaven, record this, and this is the blessing. Blessed are the dead who have died in the Lord from now until the end. Yes, they will rest from their labors because their deeds remain with them. Then I saw a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, Christ, a golden wreath atop his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another messenger proceeded from the temple and called out with a loud voice to the one who sat on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap the harvest because the harvest of the earth is full and ripe and because the time to harvest has come. So he's talking about harvesting the believers at the end of time. Then the one seated on the cloud swung the sickle over the earth and the earth gave up its harvest. You remember back uh, Christ uh, talking to his disciples about um, you know, the harvest is ready, or it, now is the time to harvest. Just then another messenger proceeded out of the heavenly temple. He also had a sharp sickle. Then another messenger, like the one with authority over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, again to God. He says, Take the sharp sickle and gather together the clusters of grapes from the vine of the earth, for the grapes are ripe and ready for harvest. This is a harvest of judgment. So the heavenly messenger swung his sickle over the earth, gathered the fruit from the vine from the earth, and threw it into the great winepress, which is the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside of the city, and blood flowed from the winepress. The blood ran deep and reached as high as the bridle on a horse and ran for a distance of about 185 miles. Um, this scene ends uh, with Christ coming at the end of the tribulation to gather up his children in a harvest of the faithful, a harvest of grain, and also to judge those who chose to remain estranged from the one creator, the one and only true God, a harvest of grapes. Uh, it's interesting here, uh, Juliet Ward, a songwriter, once echoed uh, these same verses in a song that tried to link uh, the end of time, the judgment at the end of time, with what was taking place in the Civil War. Written in 1861, listen to just two of the verses. You will recognize them right away. But first, let me read again uh, from the scripture, verses 14, chapter 14, verse 19. So the heavenly messenger swung his sickle over the earth, gathered the fruit of the vine from the earth, and threw it into the great wine press, which is the wrath of God. Now listen to these two verses, and I'm sure you'll figure out the song right away. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosened the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpets that shall never call retreat. He is shifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. O oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. So Harriet Beecher Stoll, and echoing the words from Revelation chapter 14, is talking about judgment and a harvest of grapes that we've just completed. Um, 
I look forward to uh, next uh, next Sunday. We'll get into the next two chapters, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've uh, a little bit understanding. I hope I've uh, slowed down enough for you to capture it. I've been sending out the uh, resource material beforehand so you can kind of gauge and see uh, what we're going to be studying. I hope you're using that. Let's bow our heads and uh, close with prayer. Our Father God, thank you for the lesson today. Thank you for giving us understanding into what John was trying to tell us. May we always be mindful that you, the creator, are the choice that we should be making. Be with each and every one of us um, throughout the rest of this week and bring us again safely next Sunday. In thy name we pray. Amen. See you online next week.